Hi, Paula. Sorry I can't be with you in Paris. Remember when we were in Paris together? That was great. But, you know, things get you down. Uh, health gets you down. And I'm a kind of street walker. And if I can't walk the streets, I don't enjoy cities very much. Uh, so what can I say? Uh, also, Paula, one of the things I wanted to, to say is, you know, uh, these recent days, I, uh, I've been keeping the birds you gave me in Paris near me because I remember how beautiful, uh, how beautiful you read to me about your favorite animal, the birds. And uh, then you gave me this thing, this whatever. And uh, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Also, these days I've been drinking out of a mug with the face of a rebel without a cause. Mainly because that rebel without a cause said something I believe in. Dream as if you will live forever and live as if you'll die today. Never were truer words spoken to someone at my condition. <laughs> so, the colonization of the present, that's what you want. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be hard, my dear, very hard. But one of my adopted mothers said, I can inventarlos. And, uh, well, you know, she was posthumous adopted mother. But. So let, let, let me start on the few words I put together for this event, dear Paula. When one gets old and stops running, because the body will not permit one to run anymore, and in fact, one is lucky to shuffle along, one wonders what have I been doing while I was running. Well, as my great pal Hannah Arendt once said, between past and future, and her pal Jacques Derrida said, in the interval, between past and future. Actually, they are pals because I make them pals. Because I think that if they had met, they might have been pals. If for no other reason that they were forgivers of the Nazis, they had known intimately. I find that fascinating that they are such forgivers of the Nazis they were intimate with once upon a time. Because until recently, I couldn't even forgive my parents, let alone Nazis and other sundry imperialists. I guess it has come to me lately that without love, forgiveness is not possible. Uh, and some delude themselves, I think, perhaps. So, anyway, my forgiveness of my biological parents was recent when my son started teaching me how to love. He's a forgiver. <laughs> Sorry to laugh, but I got my calaveras in my ears and my mad woman in the attic on my chest. And, uh, well, there you go. Next paragraph. In a sense, like my posthumous adopted mother, Rosario Castellanos, no doy por vivido, sino lo redactado. She thought that 
la permanencia de las palabras es mayor cuando se documentan que cuando se hablan. El pasado corre el riesgo de perderse inclusive su realidad cuando ésta se consagra a la palabra oral. I think Gloria Saldú agreed with her because she gave up her life and her sanity as much as she could grasp it to the writing and talking. Rosario felt as if the word were equivalent to the property of the object itself, as if she owned the object when she named it. It's a comforting delusion for a writer, an artist, a philosopher, even an actor. In recent months, it became crystal clear that I couldn't run anymore, not even in my imagination. So I decided to go back to the future, the chronicle I had foretold for myself to lay down the foundations of my self-definition as well as my self-invention and self-determination. I had drawn that desire from my adopted mother, Rosario Castellanos, and had been reinforced in my desire by my stepsister, Gloria Anzaldúa, someone whose writings found a home as well in my thinking. Neither my adopted mother, my adopted sister, nor I were seized by the Zoom politicon, as Rosario called it, that is the political zeitgeist until we were almost 30 years old. We harbored a spirit with a Zoom politicon, but it took a long time to get the words put together to verbalize it. Wasted a lot of time looking for love in all the corners of the earth, in all the wrong places, And even in disguise, my adopted grandmother, Sor Juana, was condemned, was condemned to look for, and she was also condemned to death by the church, like her adopted sister, Joan of Arc. Without the Zoom, without Politicon, that Zoom zeitgeist, that political zeitgeist, is not possible to transform, transcodify, and transition so that we can invent ourselves. Some of our relations were swallowed up by their traditional domesticity. But La Loca de la Casa couldn't bear it. So she went to live another life again. My adopted grandmother was destroyed by her confessor. My adopted mother was betrayed by her favorite philosopher in Mexico. My older stepsister Malinche was betrayed by her conqueror, doomed to be the Mexican whore, par excellence, to this day. And Saldua, my most recent adopted sister, was hard to comprehend until recently 
around 2007, my tokaya saved her from a possible oblivion by founding the uh, conferences that she has been leading for, uh, oh, 12 years now, I guess. My adopted mother, Rosario Castellanos, in the 70s says that dentro de una sociedad enajenada, o sea, México, una de las criaturas más enajenadas, como lo es la mujer, no tiene acceso a la autenticidad ni siquiera por la vía de la creación. That is writing, philosophizing, and so forth. So many social obstacles, she says, economic and moral, too. She thinks that even creativity is condemned to repetition. In reading her poetry, I called it a product of her, of la nymphomania. I used it as a concept metaphor for her because her poetic work is, is just filled with women models of yesteryear looking for herself in the printed word of yesteryear. So she was looking among so many women in her poetry that I said, she's an infomaniac. <laughs> it's a joke. Although some people haven't understood my joke. Then I find, no lie, that Gloria Ansardua is saying something similar or that for me has echoed with Rosario's thought. And this is Gloria now, quoted at Glory Gloria, alienated from her mother culture alien in the dominant, dominant culture, that's a double colonization, the woman of color does not feel safe within the inner life of herself. Petrified, she can't respond. Her face caught between los intersticios, that the spaces between the different worlds she inhabits. That's in this bridge called home. She's virtually condemned to bridging. Good grief, that girl never stopped bridging. If you read all her work, you see that she's always trying to bridge something. No wonder she was exhausted and died too early for some of us, our taste. 2004, Gloria and Saldúa, like Rosario and even Sor Juana, went in search of herself and the life she longed to live. The life being lived is not the one that any of them wanted to live. And Saldúa found a form of life she had to live as I have. And, the, and Gloria found it in the symbolic goddess daughter of the zombie mother, Cuatlicue, called Coyorchaki, a girl betrayed by her brother and mother, zombie mother, actually as Malinche was then betrayed by her mother and brother. In any case, her brother, that is Korachaki's brother, shattered all her bones. I'm wearing her bones right here. 
shattered all her bones as he threw her down the pyramid stairs, the imperialist pyramid stairs. The girl was in pieces, them bones, them bones, you know. It's the many pieces and fragmentation of her mythical sister that Ansaldua appropriated as the guiding light to her self-salvation, the continuous doing and undoing of herself, the deconstruction and reconstruction that may never end, the codification and recodification that may never end, because them imperialists don't want to end. They're, up, they're on top of us right now, again, and bigger and mightier than ever. And Saldua's telos, or mission, as is mine, was a quest for personal and political decolonization, a self-reconstruction of a damaged self due to the golpes, the shocks, the traumas, of multiple colonizations, including one's family. That's the greatest, the greatest betrayal. And, it, you know, it doesn't have to be your biological family because right now Trump is doing it for the children in, in the detention camps. They will be shocked, traumatized, and golpeados. And they will be damaged children. Women today are in grave danger as the globalization of imperialism seek to take away everything we ever tried to achieve in the past 50 years or so, more than that. Our self-definition, our self-determination, and self-invention, they're trying to take it away from us. The greatest repetition ever of our subjugation under the heel of imperialists, as Castellanos knew in her poem, Lamentación de Dido, look it up, girlfriend, and Lamentación the Koyashaki and lamentation of the many betrayed by the heel of imperialism. If we do not submit to the imperialist not new laws, we will be killed and subjugated. Uh, there's a lot of crime going on in the United States. I cannot, I have devoted my past, I don't know, three or four years uh, well, certainly three years of looking at crime shows, new crime shows, even vampires. There, <laughs> and uh, you know, in the end, you wish you were a vampire. You can live forever, even if you have to sleep all day. In U.S., Georgia has passed the heartbeat law. I am told by my son, which criminalizes. Miscarriages, as such, the girl or women or woman has to be criminally investigated by law enforcement, enforcement as whether the miscarriage was naturally spontaneous or manually induced. After such law enforcement investigation, a judge decides whether to incarcerate her or let her go. Alabama is following suit with the caveat that if girl or woman is impregnated incestually, ancestral abuse, she must give birth to the child. At this point, a total of 28 states are moving in this direction. 
my son tells me, because I haven't been looking at the news, I have been looking at crime on my laptop. To borrow, uh, to borrow from, uh, or rather most of women and men behind bars are on death row have been verbally or physically or sexually abused, my programs and documentaries tell me. I've been reading crime since I was 11 years old and also 11 years old in the flesh when children were being killed around the Chicago area. I've been reading crime since I was about 14. So in life and fiction and now documentaries and films, I have been devoted to reading crimes. Ah, uh, it's a quirk. According to U.S. law enforcement profilers, serial killers only begin to be noticed in the 70s. Well, I think they have existed for a long time, if I remember my Dracula. Now I have a PS, which is really a kind of PS that rounds out my experience in the U.S. In 1970s, I went to the Indiana University Auditorium <coughs> to listen to Phyllis Chaffley's uh, campaign against the Equal Rights Amendment, which as those in the U.S. know. And uh, it appears that Chaffley's surrogate has struck in Alabama and has abolished abortion altogether, criminalizing doctors and women and girls. So much for our desire for self-definition, self-determination, and self-invention. Hey, sisters, we got to go to Mexico again and cross the border in Tijuana, in Juarez, and I don't know where else in Mexico. That's where they used to get the abortions. At least my mother did. I of a bet I know. That's where she got it. Once upon a time. Yes, once upon a time. That's we live in a life of crime. Crime that sometimes wants to make me run for the exit. But I'll wait for you, if you want. Ah, thanks.